I'd like to uh, welcome you today to uh, EMS Trauma Grand Rounds, and uh, our speaker is Dr. Kirk Brent Heisel, and uh, he works here at the University of Utah, got his education here at the University of Utah, and is boarded in internal medicine and emergency medicine. Correct. That's the old way. The old way, yeah. Yeah, they used to do that over at LB. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that. Uh, has an interest in uh, EMS. And uh, he's going to talk about pelvic tra uh, trauma, which is always one of those uh, conundrums uh, to take care of and that. And uh, turn the time over to you. Thanks, Russ. Um, yeah, I'd just like to give you uh, uh, just a thumbnail stretch. Sorry, a thumbnail sketch of my um, history. I've been here at the university for nearly uh, 27 years. And um, been involved as our Air Med medical director, as our division chief here, and now um, I'm involved in our observation medicine as our director. But uh, we have a big role, all of the attendings in, in trauma, and one of the areas that I've been interested in is uh, pelvic trauma. I had a case this past spring where we had a, a gentleman flown in from rural uh, Wyoming with uh, really some massive uh, pelvic trauma. And during that uh, case, the orthopods and the trauma surgeons and we were all talking about how bad the pelvic fractures were and talked about the um, rotational and vertical instability. And that led me to uh, uh, kind of some study of this area and from that uh, arose this lecture. Okay, uh, we want to talk here about uh, pelvic trauma. We're going to be talking uh, about some background in pelvic trauma, pelvic anatomy. We're going to be talking about pelvic ring disruptions, uh, some generalized trauma assessments, and then uh, specialize that to some specifics uh, on pelvic trauma, talk about associated injuries, trauma resuscitation, uh, the complications of uh, hemorrhage, and then we're going to talk about some management and transfer considerations. Is this coming through okay? Okay. Okay, just some background on, on uh, pelvic trauma. Uh, it is uh, a disease uh, and injury pattern that both adults and children have. I uh, tend to see more of it with adults and children, uh, of course. Um, and here's kind of how they break down. Uh, of course, the big one is uh, uh, motor vehicle accidents. We see that a lot. Uh, motorcycle accidents uh, are also a big, a big player. Uh, and unfortunately, we do have a fair amount of auto pedestrian uh, accidents. Uh, we do get falls. The ones that we're more concerned with are the long falls, but we're also going to be talking about the elderly and their more ground level falls. Uh, some crush injuries uh, also make up the uh, the totals. Children uh, don't tend to have as many motor vehicle accidents, but unfortunately they have a lot of uh, auto pedestrian accidents. The, the real tragic ones that you hear about every now and then are the patients uh, that uh, accidentally are run over you know, in driveways and things like that. So um, that's a big uh, problem when you get a child with a multiple injury and, and pelvic fractures. Uh, there tends to be a bimodal distribution in uh, pelvic trauma. We see a fair amount of it, of course, in the younger aged. Uh, uh, this tends to be the uh, male uh, uh, drivers on motorcycles and high-speed uh, motor vehicle collisions. And then we tend to get another uh, peak with the, the more elderly patients uh, from more serious ground level falls. And also, they tend to have uh, worse injuries with the same kind of force in motor vehicle collisions. As in most trauma, men predominate. I guess we're not very smart, um, but the 75% the really is when you take uh, into consideration the, the serious motor vehicle collisions. The 50% tends to be a pretty similar ratio in the elderly when they fall, ground level falls causing uh, pelvic trauma. Uh, pelvic fractures are pretty common. There's still three to eight percent of all fractures, uh, and it's a big part of our uh, trauma uh, assessment because 
when you've got a multiply injured uh, patient, at least a quarter of them are going to have some sort of pelvic fracture. Uh, mortality rates are all over the board. They can be as high uh, on the average patient as 20 percent, uh, and it depends on how you select them. Certain populations, uh, younger populations, that may be lower down into the 3 percent range. Uh, but in, in any kind of injury with pelvic fractures, uh, for the same type of injury pattern, the elderly are going to have more morbidity and mortality. Um, when you're looking at a, a, a patient that has a pelvic fracture and you're trying to predict outcomes, just like with other types of uh, uh, multiple trauma patients, it's really their overall injury severity score uh, that's going to determine their mortality. There are specifics with pelvic trauma that we'll talk about, but it really depends on what else is injured other than just their, their pelvis. We're going to talk uh, a fair amount about hemorrhage. Um, it's still the, 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 the biggest problem in a pelvic fracture. Uh, the, the, the pelvis has its own specific problems, but we do get uh, extra pelvic um, uh, bleeding uh, that can be very problematic and, and lead to uh, uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, as in most of our multiple trauma patients, uh, severe head injury, um, and interabdominal injury and bleeding are the the areas that we get our early deaths in most likely. Is this coming across? Is there, there's there's some kind of echo. How, if I just if I just talk here, am I okay? No, you have to. Well, mine's fine. You just have to talk through that mic because somebody else is using this mic. When I talk in the mic, I'm get I'm getting some reverberation. If I if I talk with this, is it okay? Why don't I just why don't I just talk with this because it's, it's not. okay. How about how is this? Okay. Okay. So multi-system organ failure and sepsis results uh, in the delayed deaths, as in many types of trauma patients, they can get uh, soft tissue infections near the fracture sites, and this uh, can lead to sepsis and. Uh, uh, all of these are delayed uh, types of, of morbidity and mortality. So we want to spend a fair amount of time talking about pelvic anatomy. If you're going to understand the types of pelvic fractures, you really have to have some basic understanding of, of pelvic anatomy. Uh, and here's a good uh, uh, representation. Um, there are really uh, 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 several ways you can look at how many bones there are in the pelvis. We're going to talk about that. Most people are lumpers and they call this bone right here, this entire complex, the innominate bone. And then you've got a, a sacrum. So you've got two innominate bones and one sacrum to make up really the bony pelvis. But it's not that simple. Um, the in the innominate bone here, and, and it's an interesting name. Does anybody know what innominate means? It means nameless. If you, if you look at the Latin for innominate, it means without name. Um, but embryologically, uh, and, and to really help classify fractures, we break down the innominate bone into three specific bones. The ilium, which is really this high riding uh, area of the innominate, the ischium, down here, which really was derived from the term a haunch bone. When you sit on your haunches, you're sitting on your ischium. And then the pubis, the pubis bones right here, okay? And so those, those three bones really comprise the anominate. Um, there is a embryologic uh, development. This is a, a good way to look at the innominate bone. The superior part of that is what we call the ilium. And it provides about one-third of the acetabulum, which is the, the, the joint that we have in the pelvis. The ischium is this part right here, and that provides, like I said, the haunch and a part of the acetabulum. And then this is the pubis, and we're going to talk about the pubis synthesis here, but this bone 
which provides the rami, the pubic rami, is the, uh, the, the pubis. So back to here, so we've got these two innominate bones and the, and the sacrum, and that really uh, houses the, the pelvic, You'll, uh, pelvis. You will hear about the true and the false pelvis. Those are two uh, terms that are used. This is the pelvic rim right here, and anything above that, these wings of the iliac, are part of the false pelvis. Uh, most of the visceral organs that we're going to talk about reside internally here in the, in the pelvic rim. The pelvis has uh, five different joints. The, the acetabular or the hip joints are here, uh, and those are what we would call more true joints. Those are joints with a lot of flexibility, you know, like your elbow and your shoulder, knee joints. Those are really the more true joints. And then there's the sacroiliac joints here bilaterally, and then this joint, the pubis symphysis. And these are not really the normal type of joints that we see. There's not a lot of flexibility here. They're really fused and have limited uh, ability to, to, to move. These are joints, though, that, uh, for example, in a pregnant woman, that do spread and, and, and migrate out over time. Uh, so they, and, and they do have a little bit of flexibility, but not a lot. They're really held down by the ligamentous structures, and we're going to get to that in just, just a minute. The sacrum is uh, the other part of the uh, three bones that we're, we were talking about, the nominate on both sides, and the sacrum. The sacrum is an interesting bone as well. It really is the, one of the key bones of the pelvis for, for several reasons. One, uh, and, and the interesting thing about sacrum is it really means, it's a Latin term, os sacrum, what meant sacred or holy bone. Uh, the, so the sacrum is your holy bone, and it was thought that the, the Latins, or the people that came up with this, uh, did it for because this is where the woman's womb is and life is created here, but it really doesn't mean that. Sacrum, the other term for that, is great, and this is the greatest, the biggest, widest, and most secure of all your spinal bones. So the sacrum is the great, the great bone, or you've really got two nameless bones and a and a holy bone there, and that all forms the, the, the pelvis. But as you can see here, just like you need a key stone bone and a bridge and, and for support, this really provides the majority of the support in the, in the pelvis. And we, when we talk about pelvic fractures, this is the crucial area. The pelvic ligaments really are what keeps the pelvis together. If you didn't have pelvic ligaments, uh, there wouldn't be any stability. That SI joints and the uh, symphysis pubis, if that all were not there, it would just be bones that were stacked against each other and would, would easily fall apart. These ligaments are some of the strongest in the body. When they do pathology studies and they get these anatomists in there looking at it, these are tough and fibrous and we're going to show you uh, some pictures of that. So these pelvic ligaments are crucial. Uh, there are seven types, and, and really the symphysis pubis is not a true ligament. It's more just kind of a block, a disc of fibrocartilage. Uh, where the others have some more elasticity, this doesn't. But we're going to talk about the anterior sacroiliac, the posterior. You've got some iliolumbar ligaments. You've got these floor of the pelvis ligaments, the sacral spinal and sacral tubal, and also some inner osseous ligaments, whole bunch of ligaments that are holding the pelvis together. And here's a, a, a picture of that. This is kind of in the uh, anterior approach. Uh, here's our symphysis pubis. At the floor of the pelvis, we have these two very crucial bones. Uh, one is from the sacrum to the spinous process here. And you'll often see in, in pelvic fractures that you have volts bone off here. The other one, you can see it better on the posterior uh, aspect, is this one right here, the sacral tuberous. And that's from the ischial sacrum uh, uh, I'm sorry, from the sacrum to the, the ischial uh, tuberous part of the bone. So those are the posterior ligaments. And here is where the SI joint was. You've got some anterior sacroiliac joints. And then in the back, we'll see we've got some posterior ones. And there's also some important ligaments that go off the anterior posterior spine of the, of the uh, ilium here to the fifth uh, lateral process of the, of the lumbar vertebrae.
And often, again, with, with trauma, you can avulse off these pro, uh, transverse processes on the lumbar uh, vertebrae. So here's a, a look at the posterior aspect of that. Uh, again, look, appreciate how big and thick and strong these, these ligaments are. It takes massive amounts of force to rupture these, these ligaments. And here you can see that, that iliolumbar one we saw in the anterior view. And now we also have these posterior uh, sacroiliac. So the sacroiliac really has uh, ligaments in front and back, and it's a very fibrous, and it's why there isn't a lot of flex, at least uh, acutely. There's not much uh, flexibility there. Uh, with time, like we mentioned, and, a, and pelvic uh, and pregnant uh, women, these can slowly stretch to help uh, open the uh, pelvic outlet for, for birthing. Um, again, uh, this is one of the, the crucial ones right here. This is that sacral uh, spinous and also the sacral tuberous ligaments. All of those provide uh, support uh, for, the, uh, for the pelvis. Okay, when we talk about pelvic fractures, there's one concept that's very important. And that's called the ring concept. And I think people have heard about that. That if you had a true ring, a uh, solid single structured ring, and you broke it, that really the force to break one part of it is going to break another part of it. You, you have a really hard time breaking a ring in one spot. It's just the, the physics of a, of, a, of a ring. And that is also how most of these fractures are. You break it one spot, you weaken it one spot, you'll weaken it uh, another. There are a couple, and we'll give you those examples of exceptions to that, um, uh, and we'll go through that. So when we look at pelvic fractures, we either classify them as stable or unstable. And a stable fracture really is anyone that's not unstable. And how is it unstable? It can be unstable in two different uh, fashions. You can have a rotational component where really the, the wings of the pelvis are going to open up like a book, and we'll be talking about open book fractures. So that's the, that's the rotational component. And there's also uh, a, a vertical component where you can have the pelvis break and it can on a vertical axis can can displace so and you can have combinations here the bad fractures have both rotational and vertical instability there's been a number of uh, uh, orthopedists really th uh, that have uh, characterized uh, how to classify these fractures and uh, the first one that came out was Pinnell and his uh, group and they looked at there are three major vectors of force that cause pelvic injuries. Anterior, posterior, uh, and we'll show you some pictures of that, lateral compression, or vertical shear, which can, uh, if somebody falls from a height, or uh, will often, and they usually don't fall directly on their feet, but they can, but it also can be tangentially and cause uh, various types of injuries. The, the, really, the, the first major classification where they actually looked at all types of fractures was, the, was tiles classification. And he came out with an A and a B, and if it was a little bit worse, you got a, a higher number here, A1 versus an A2. Then they talked about the, the open book fractures, and then, then when they're both uh, unstable, rotational and vertical. Uh, but we're not going to really go over that one as much as we are the next one. This is the one that... Uh, when orthopedists and traumologists talk to each other, emergency physicians, they talk about the Young and Burgess classification. That's really the one that everybody uh, uses uh, pretty much so that we're talking on the same, um, uh, have the same system to talk about these. And these, uh, just like the, the, the tile uh, classification, really talks about the vector of force. Uh, the anterior, posterior compression, lateral compression, vertical shear. Uh, these are the the big types of fractures that we see. And they also divide them into types one, two, and three, and as you get further up the numbers, they are increasingly severe and more likely to be unstable. So we're gonna give you some examples of these with both graphic demonstrations and some, some x-rays. So here's a young Burgess A. This is the, the lateral compression. Here's a, a typical mechanism. Someone hit auto pedestrian accident from with, a, with a lateral uh, force. Um, so and lateral compression one. And these are fractures that tend to, tend to be very stable. Um, they can have sacral fractures. You can get pubic rami fractures. 
Uh, they can bleed, they can have some pain and problems, some, some disability, but generally these do very well. Uh, generally, uh, depending on how bad these rami fractures are, these are going to be somebody that is put kind of initially uh, a non-weight bearing and, and then slowly will be able to, to be ambulated. So that's a, a, a pretty simple one, usually stable. Here's an x-ray representation of that. Uh, there's some pubic rami fractures here. You may get a sacral fracture here that you can kind of see some of the lucencies there. So that's a, that's a pretty stable fracture that uh, hopefully is not going to give you too much problem. The next one is the, the, the lateral compression too. And this is really where you get uh, a little bit more serious injuries. You tend to get ileal wing fractures here. Uh, you can get pubic rami fractures. You can get some uh, uh, separation of your SI joint here. But this again is usually stable. Here's a look at the ligaments. They're usually intact. They may be irritated. Uh, but generally they are, are stable and nothing is disrupted and there is no rotational or vertical instability to this type of uh, fracture. Here's another x-ray where there's a lucency here. That's, here's the SI joint to tell the difference. And here's this fracture through the iliac uh, wing. Uh, there's some uh, superior and inferior pubic rami fractures. Uh, you can see a little displacement of that rami here. Uh, you could be involved with some bladder injury. We'll talk more about that later. But again, usually stable, may bleed, may cause pain, may need to be pinned, uh, but they tend to be more, more stable uh, and, and shouldn't cause the massive hemorrhage that some of the other ones do that we're going to talk about. Okay, up the scale, this one tends to be uh, more severe and more serious, the lateral compression three. Uh, this tends to be, this, if you just looked at this right half of the pelvis here, that was just like the last one we talked about, a two. Uh, but this one's different in that the force uh, most likely came in here on the right lateral side, caused this kind of crush injury here, but also probably bent back this left uh, leg and left hemipelvis here to cause multiple injuries on this left side. Uh, you can see the pubic rami fractures, these uh, sacral tubercle and sacral uh, uh, spinous uh, ligaments have been completely disrupted. Here's the SI joint. It is torn anteriorly. Uh, generally with these, the posterior part of that is still intact. If you'd lost this, this would not only, here, if you lost the posterior part, it would not only be an uh, open book fracture, an open book as you understand is uh, how you open this book. If you were to test this, and we'll talk about this, this iliac uh, a half of the innominate bone here would just fly back. Um, but it's still intact here, so it's not going vertically unstable. Here's an example of that. This one is actually the, the worst injuries here on the right where the SI joint is uh, disrupted. You've got the, yeah, the fractures of the pubic rami fractures here uh, as well. So this is an open book fracture. Uh, a young Burgess B uh, uh, is uh, uh, an anterior, posterior, often a, a, a crush injury, as in the, the example uh, uh, here. Um, here is the, uh, the type 1, and this is a, a, also a very common injury that we see that we may not even get the, uh, you know, the trauma service involved in. It usually uh, is a, a low speed MVC or a sports injury. Uh, seen this in rugby players, uh, uh, which is kind of like organized trauma. Um, often you get a, a, a diastasis, which just means a, a slight separation of the, of the pubic rami here. Um, normally, as we put on one of the earlier slides, it should be only about five millimeters. Uh, and if it goes between five millimeters, this distance here, to less than two centimeters, we, we, we know from, from experience and then of di different literature series that things are going to be relatively stable. Your posterior elements, uh, the SI joints are not disrupted, your, your ligaments here, uh, the floor of the pelvis are not torn, and so this is usually uh, a stable fracture. You may get a little pubic rami fracture, uh, 
but it, it generally tends to be a very stable fracture and shouldn't cause a lot of long-term visibility or problems. Here's an x-ray that shows this slide opening and again you might get a pubic rami fracture but everything posteriorly and anteriorly in the SI joints are intact and, and usually don't require a lot of uh, intervention. The young Burgess B type 2 uh, tends to be more severe and this is the uh, the more classic uh, open book fracture that, that we do see. You get the diastasis of the synthesis greater than two centimeters, often get vertical uh, pubic rami fracture, and here's where you start seeing uh, a lot of the uh, anterior, at least, SI joints torn, the, the, the floor of the, the pelvis ligaments uh, torn as well, uh, and, and with the two, you still keep the posterior part of it intact, so there's no uh, vertical translocation, so it's unstable just rotationally, another open book fracture from a different mechanism, uh, and, and these uh, are often uh, unstable and are going to require uh, interventions. Here's another example of that. Here's the diastasis. Uh, here is the SI joint here, but over here you can see a little bit better that there's the SI joint here is widened and opened, um, causing that to the right, this, this right hemipelvis is uh, an open book. <clears throat> the APC3 is the, the of the uh, anterior posterior types is the, is the worst one, it's the most unstable. Uh, it, it has complete disruption of the synthesis pubis, you've got the, the floor ligaments torn, the SI joints both anteriorly here and posteriorly here. Uh, uh, torn and so this is unstable in both a, uh, a rotational open book fashion and also vertically. If you look at your x-rays, if you see more than one centimeter of discrepancy on the height of your iliac crest, uh, unless it's due to, you know, just to rotational things uh, technically on the x-ray, but obviously here it's, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven centimeters, you know you've got a vertical uh, instability. And here, as you can see, you've got fractures that have opened up the, the, the synthesis. You've got fractures here and you've got fractures all through here. You can see the sacrum is fractured and that SI joint is totally disrupted. And these have a very high incidence of major hemorrhage and we'll talk more about that. There's also a young Burgess C. We don't see this one quite as much because he's, you have to have a jumper or somebody that's uh, parachute didn't open or something, uh, transmitting all that uh, energy. Um, here's an example of that. It's a vertical uh, shear uh, injury. You get anterior and posterior vertical displacements. Uh, this is completely unstable rotationally and vertically. Um, pretty similar to that anterior posterior compression three and that these bleed and, and the pelvis is all over the board. You need a lot of help. Here's an x-ray of that, shows the instability, the pubic rami fractures, sacral fractures, SI joint disruptions, vertical displacement. So this is a, a, a major uh, unstable pelvic fracture. Okay, so now you know the anatomy and the classifications, so let's talk about some specifics that we do on these, uh, these pelvic traumas. And when you have a pelvic trauma, obviously, uh, you're going to treat this like any trauma and that they're going to get the complete primary assessments, uh, the ABCDEs, you know, make sure you're exposing them. These people really, you know, you need to expose them completely because uh, they're going to have, almost all of these are going to have associated injuries. It's pretty rare to get just an isolated uh, pelvic fracture. It can happen, but it really is very well. So you need to be looking at these other crucial areas uh, for uh, problems and and causes of hypotension. When, and so once you've completed that, we're going we're gonna to do a more focused exam uh, on the pelvis. And here's the, the, the pelvic rock and the pelvic springs that we're doing. You do these bimanual uh, compression and distraction of the iliac wings. We're going to be pushing those down. And, and, and one caution, you know, we're a teaching center, so this, we get lots of, we got students and residents and fellows and attendings. Uh, this really, when we're doing this, really only be done once. Uh, 
the more you do that, the more you can cause bleeding and more distraction. So this is something that really needs to be um, uh, watched. So minimize that. You can do some leg traction where you're going to pull. And, it's, and if you've had I have somebody that's vertically distracted, it's this, this really funny feeling when you pull on their leg that the leg and the whole pelvis move up and down. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, we're going to be looking for uh, blood from visceral injuries on the, on the rectal exam. Uh, uh, we don't do this all the time in our traumas, but you might check for a prostate displacement that can give you some indications that you've got a urethral uh, injury. You're going to be looking at the, the, the tip of the penis or the urethra, looking for blood. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, we may be doing vaginal exams, looking for bleeding. You can have pelvic fractures that can uh, lacerate uh, inside the, uh, the vaginal areas or the uterus uh, and cause bleeding. We're going to be looking for open fractures. Uh, if you have any uh, lacerations in the perineum, that has a high association with, uh, with open pelvic fractures. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about some of these things. You can get vascular injuries, neurological injuries, visceral injuries, and an interesting degloving injury called morale lavale. Anybody know how to pronounce that? I don't. Um, so we're going to we're going we're gonna to hold off. Well, let's let's just go through this. We're going to hold off on the vascular. Uh, that's that's going to be in the hemorrhage discussion. But you can also get some neurological injuries from pelvic fractures. You've got all these uh, these uh, whoops. You've got all these. Uh, 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 nerves coming out of the, the foramen here in the, in the sacrum and when you get the uh, sacral fractures or you get this SI joint displaced you can get this lumbar sacral plexus of nerves which can cause pain and can cause leg weakness so be aware of that. The L5 and S1 areas right here are the most common ones that get uh, injured but anywhere from L2 to S4 along the entire uh, area there can have a uh, the plexus can be injured uh, here's a picture of the visceral anatomy. We've got a lot of uh, 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 organs in the in the pelvis uh, that can be injured with uh, with pelvic trauma. Uh, generally, when the pelvis is fractured, uh, bony spikes go in and uh, puncture and and, and damage uh, these these uh, areas. The the bladder is one of the most common ones. Somewhere ten to 15% of pelvic fractures have bladder injuries. They may be just as simple as a, uh, as a simple laceration. Um, most of these um, are, you can find when they've got suprapubic tenderness. You'll see gross hematuria, decreased urine, urinary output. Uh, some of these are going to need intraoperative repair. Others can be managed uh, uh, with just a Foley catheter and, uh, and watching for infection. The urethra can be uh, uh, lacerated or ruptured in a, in a fairly high percentage as well. It tends to happen more in males, but even females can get urethral injuries. Again, you're looking for blood at the meatus of the penis or the uh, female urethra. Um, you can get scrotal hematomas and bleeding around there to give you some uh, idea. Uh, they can have gross hematuria. Again, if they have blood of the meatus, you should be placing Foley catheters. They're going to need a, a retrograde urethrogram and, and cyst, retrograde cystoscopy to look for both bladder and urethral uh, integrity. Fairly common uh, complications of, uh, of pelvic trauma. There are also some interesting associated injuries from uh, pelvic trauma. You, trauma you, of course, you're going to get abrasions con and contusions. But uh, if you want to impress your colleagues, tell them that you saw a distot sign. That's a little hematoma, superficial hematoma up by the inguinal ligament or thigh. Uh, I haven't heard anybody, uh, Dr. Vargo, anybody say, hey, there's a distot sign, but, but maybe someday. Uh, another very interesting uh, injury is a degloving injury. And this is a different type of degloving injury than we see, like with extremities, when you get skin peeled back to the bone. This is an internal uh, shear injury, where when you get pelvic fractures, uh, you can shear internally there, the sub-Q, and it bleeds and it becomes devascularized and can liquefy and become infected. So that's a morel la VL, uh, usually here on the lateral, a uh, greater uh, trochanter. Uh, and you'll also be looking for scrotal labial swelling, uh, 
that may give you an idea that you've got a urethral or a bladder injury and also of course when you've got anybody like that you're going to look for fractures uh, elsewhere in the spine and, and extremities. Open pelvic fractures are really um, uh, a very serious um, uh, uh, complication of a, of a, cl of a of pelvic fracture. Uh, they're increasingly difficult to manage. Uh, so if you get a patient, you see this, uh, the mortality rates are skyrocket from you know, 10 to 20 percent to as high as 50 percent. And that's usually doing, due to a couple things. There's, it's tougher to control the bleeding. You lose the tamponade effect. We'll be talking more about that with the retroperitoneal space. But the, the big thing is they get septic much easier. With fecal contamination and, and you know, spread of, 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 of bacteria, it's the major cause in these open fractures. Um, in, in most of these open fractures that are in the perineal area, they're going to need a diverting colostomy to, to try to minimize uh, infection, morbidity, and mortality. We're not going to go over this, but this, uh, the ATLS has this pelvic fracture management algorithm. Uh, and it kind of puts them in uh, kind of critical exsanguinating uh, uh, vital signs to more uh, stable to, to very stable. And depending on what you've got, you're going to institute some of these uh, uh, different algorithms. We're going to talk about that uh, kind of more in specifics than, than go through this whole thing. I know if I had to go through that, I'd probably fall asleep. So uh, we'll, we'll go over some of the other specifics of what we're going to do. And just like in any trauma resuscitation, you know, we're going to get two large bore intravenous uh, lines going. We're going to give them crystalloids, uh, um, usually at least a, a, a liter or two, and monitor their, their, um, their blood pressure. We're going to be very uh, quick when we find out we've got uh, pelvic fractures to administer blood. When you've got unstable pelvic fractures that we've, well, we've gone over, 50 to 75% of these patients are going to require four or more units of blood. So we want to get that ready to be able to give them that. They may need some fresh frozen plasma. Uh, a, a third or more require 10 units or more uh, of, of blood. So these can bleed, bleed hard, bleed fast, and you can really get behind easily on those. And as in any trauma patient, you want to avoid or correct hypothermia. You may want to warm those fluids, keep them in a warm room, keep them covered, avoid heat loss. And as we all know, hypothermia can lead to coagulation problems, more bleeding, more arrhythmia, uh, and acid-base problems. So keep them warm uh, as best you can and, and correct that blood quickly and expeditiously. Um, Hemorrhage is really a common complication of pelvic fractures and one of the hallmarks of resuscitating patients, recognizing it and, um, and, and doing the appropriate things. But one, uh, well, where does most of the hemorrhage come from in uh, pelvic fractures? Most are low pressure venous uh, plexus bleeds and we'll show you a little bit more about that. Most of them are not major arterial bleeds. Some are, but most are not. And this bone in the pelvis, this cancellous bone, is spongy and it has a lot of blood supply. When it's broken, it oozes and, and bleeds uh, uh, quite readily. Um, so that's another part of it. Pelvic fractures, uh, when they present to us or to a, uh, an outside uh, facility, if they come in hypotensive, their uh, mortality rates are going to really increase from that 10 to 20 percent that we talked about to as high as 40 percent. Uh, and when we look at them and find out, uh, you know, what type of uh, mechanism, if they've got a shear or an anterior posterior, you know, which are most of our high-speed motor vehicle collisions, they're much more, lateral, uh, more likely to bleed than the lateral compression types. Uh, and of course, on lateral compression types, the most likely is a ground level fall or a, a fall onto their side from a, from a, you know, a, a height. Um, as most of us know, hemorrhage in pelvic fractures often is tough to, 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 to ascertain. You know, you might do your fast exams and things and not find a lot of blood. Where does it go? Many times into the retroperitoneal space. 
up to you can hold up to four liters of blood there. And the good thing about the retroperitoneal space, usually, unless it's an open fracture, is it does stop the bleeding by tamponade. All that pressure is in a confined space, and then it, uh, the pressure of that blood building up will, will uh, heal and seal off those oozing um, veins. So where do you, where do you bleed? Uh, here's, uh, you know, we're going to have a test on all these ves vessels uh, afterwards, but here are your major arterial bleeds. I'm not going to go over all those, but there are a lot of them, uh, but most of them still come from the venous plexus. When they've done uh, literature reviews on uh, pelvic fractures, um, only about 10% of the bleeds come from one of these name type of arteries. So not many of these are just one specific artery that's lacerated and bleeds like stink. Most of them come from here, this huge complex of retroperitoneal veins uh, that are injured and bleed and ooze and bleed. So this is where you get the vast majority of your of your serious bleeds is from these these venous plexus of uh, of veins. When you've got someone that's hemodynamically unstable with the pelvic fracture, it's it's easy to think well, it's got to be from the pelvic fracture. That's a common cause of bleeding, common cause of hemorrhage. But you'll be uh, up the creek if that's the only thing you consider. You've got to think about other causes of bleeding. You know. Uh, and I, I think in a in a trauma center, you know, we think about this, but but don't don't forget that the chest can hold a bunch of blood, hemothorax. You could even be dealing with uh, a, a dissection that's, that's that's bleeding. Forty percent of pelvic fracture patients have intra-abdominal bleeding, and these intra-abdominal bleeders usually take precedent over the pelvic bleeders. You know, they're gonna. Usually these pelvic fractures can be, and we'll talk about ways to control them, usually can be controlled. But if they've got a, an active you know, uh, liver lack or splenic lack, uh, that's got to take precedence over those, these pelvic fractures. Same thing with, with uh, chest bleeding and the compromise of the, of the airway. You can also get hypotensive in these patients from intracranial bleeds uh, or spinal shock. Um, these often have associated injuries of the of the spinal canal, unfortunately. Extremity fractures can cause blood and also the, the coagulopathies. So think about all those things when you've got a patient with, uh, with a pelvic fracture. Um, what do we do to, to work up a, a, a pelvic fracture uh, initially? Well, we do fast exams. We do ultrasound, uh, looking for, for blood in the, in the, in the pelvis. Uh, we're going to do... Uh, part of the standard protocol is to an AP portable pelvis. And interestingly, this will pick up 90% of your pelvic fractures. You know, So when you look at that AP pelvis, you're going to pick up the vast majority of it. You may not get all the detail that you want, uh, but it will pick it up. You may have to go to abdominal and pelvic CTs. That's a big standard part of our, our radiographic workup. You know, and you're going to see something like this sacral fracture, this open book fracture here, and you're going to get a lot more detail. And you can now do reformatting and look at the pelvis and in a lot of different angles. Uh, but that, that fast exam and the AP pelvis that we're going to get immediately can often give you a very good clue as to what's going on so that you can, uh, you know, focus your resuscitation. And then finally you'll get your abdominal pelvic CTs to give you some more specifics as to who's going to need uh, to go to the operating room and, and, and more of your definitive treatments. Um, what we do specifically for these patients, uh, when you see these patients come into your you know, emergency department uh, as an orthopedist or as an emergency uh, physician, is really going to be dependent very much largely on the capabilities of your hospital that you're working at. If you're in a small rural area, you're not going to probably, uh, maybe not even have an orthopedist that you can get in. Uh, or maybe you've got an orthopedist, uh, the one in the community that uh, is not going to be comfortable with managing these, these multiply injured uh, 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 patients. So after you've completed your primary assessments and you think that the patient has a, a significant pelvic hemorrhage, what are you going to do? Well, you've got uh, a number of options. Uh, you may opt to do one of these things. You may do put a sheet, you may use pelvic binders, you may use mass pants or these pneumatic anti-shock garments. And if you've got a, a, a trained 
uh, uh, orthopod uh, that's, that's helping you, you may put on some kind of an external fixation uh, device. There are some fix fixators that are really just kind of a preliminary fi uh, fixation to try to stabilize things, and then there's others that are really intraoperative that are going to give you a definitive treatment. And we're talking here really more about uh, an orthopedist that's going to put on a temporizing uh, X-fix to, uh, to stabilize that patient, uh, possibly prior to transport. So here are some homemade binders. You can do about anything you want. You know, you can wrap a sheet around and use some towel clips uh, to, to, to try to, to stabilize things. Here's another sheet. Uh, probably wouldn't advise this being so narrow, uh, but that, that, that can help. Um, from what I've seen and been able to, to read, uh, there's some sheet technology that you need to know. And that is that you should use a fairly wide, you know, probably about 12 or 18 inches wide of a sheet. You don't want just one band, like a rope around it. You want, you want to attack this in multiple planes. So you're going to wrap a sheet. You're going to put the superior edge up at the top of the superior iliac crest and the iliac wings, and the inferior edge down on the upper thigh. So you get a fairly good, you know, section to, uh, to, 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 to tie together. You can use a towel clamp like you, you saw, or you can tie a big knot there. Uh, best if you keep the hips slightly flexed and you internally rotate the, uh, uh, the legs. That will help get you some uh, better uh, mechanistic compression of those, uh, of those uh, bleeders. We also have a number of commercial products uh, available. I've seen patients come in with both of these uh, fixators uh, on. Uh, they they're you know fairly wide that you can you know get a, a a wider area of compression again they they fit between the the top and the and the bottom of the of the pelvis you can cinch these things up uh to try to slowly bring in those rotationally deformed uh pelvises and they and they and they work fairly well I really don't have any uh preference on one or another uh and I think there are multiple ones um Historically, we used to use, you know, mass pants, these pneumatic anti-shock uh, garments. Um, uh, all the ambulance rigs used to carry these. We used to see patients brought in all the time. But as we studied these more, we found some problems. You could get compartment syndromes in the legs, went up here in the abdomen. Uh, uh, you can cause an abdominal compartment syndrome. You could have trouble with breathing because it, it, it made the moving of the diaphragm more difficult. So. These are not used uh, as, a, as a primary resuscitation device you know, in the United States anymore. Uh, if this is all you had, you could probably inflate the pelvic abdominal compartment without the legs. Uh, a big problem with these is you didn't have access to the abdomen and the pelvis and the perineum and the legs. Uh, so that's why these are not used very much. But if you push came to shove, at least you could use maybe the, the abdominal pelvic compartment of it. Here's a picture of some of the external fixators. Um, you can put these uh, on uh, a lot of ways. These, these are more definitive ones that you do, but uh, occasionally uh, I've seen patients come in uh, with these on uh, in, a, in a relative uh, uh, temporizing fashion uh, to help uh, stabilize uh, somebody. They're usually direct admits to the hospital because they've been out someplace for a while and develop sepsis or something. Uh, we don't tend to get these very often in acute trauma assessments. You can also do C clamps uh, here. You do these under fluoro usually, and, and these again uh, can be both a definitive uh, treatment or uh, a temporizing. In our uh, log rhythms that uh, we kind of briefly showed there, we have a, uh, an angiography. Um, uh, loop that you can you can go to, um, and I want to tell you some of the indications and maybe some of the problems with angiography. Um, when do you do it? Well, usually it's when you've done uh, your full stabilizations. You've aggressively resuscitated these patients, and they continue to bleed. They continue to be hypotensive, uh, and you're looking for for you know for something. Um, also, if they have a pulseless extremity, would be an indication to. Uh, to do acute angiography. And so you go in and you, you know, inject and you're looking for a blush as you do the different boluses and you'll see bleeding continue. 
Uh, the problem is that it really only identifies about 10 to 15 percent of the of the patients that you'll see something. Um, it does not address venous bleeding, you know. So if you've got this unstable patient, you do it. Uh, you can find one of the major arteries that's got a blush and bleeding. You can try to embolize that uh, that artery, and that has a pretty good success rate, but it's sure not 100%. Uh, you can sometimes slow things down. This is very time-consuming and resource-dependent. Uh, uh, not a lot of places have this capability. Some do. Uh, it may be something you want to look at it at somebody and probably a higher level of care hospital. But some of the smaller hospitals have this capability and, and occasionally uh, uh, use it. So really kind of as a, a summation here, what are, what are really the, uh, the management and disposition uh, issues? Okay? Serious pelvic fractures are complicated, as we've mentioned. There can be many associated injuries. Uh, we need to consider this one of the few life-threatening orthopedic emergencies uh, that really need a multidisciplinary approach that usually the trauma centers have. We have to aggressively treat these as a, as a team and, and kind of take care of these. Uh, if you're in a small facility that doesn't have that team and doesn't have that, the, the neurosurgeons and general surgeons and orthopedists and, and other uh, physicians that you need and nursing care that you need, you really want to consider early transfer, especially for the high-risk patient. Who are the high-risk patients? Those are the ones that we talked about at the onset with the unstable fractures rotationally, vertically unstable fractures. Any of these elderly patients, you know, they have the higher morbidities and mortalities. You know, try to uh, uh, transfer them uh, early. And if obviously they're hemodynamically unstable, require uh, multiple units of blood, uh, these are ones that you're going to want to very uh, aggressively uh, treat and consider early uh, transfer to trauma centers. Uh, what, in conclusion, what is really your, your, your management algorithm for an unstable pelvic fracture? It's really pretty simple. Identification, rigorous resuscitation. We've talked about the various ways you can mobilize these unstable uh, fractures and then arrange uh, transfer. Okay, that completes my pelvic trauma f lecture. Are there any specific questions from my large audience? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the difference between the sheet and the, and the commercial project, there's no research out there that says one's better than the other. When I, when I just looked at that, the, you know, looking, the question was, is there any difference between using a sheet and the pelvic binders? And what I found uh, was no, I don't think anybody's going to get this through a, 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 a IRB to, to, to do a clinical trial between, between the two. My gestalt from reading the uh, various uh, recent literature on it is that if you do the sheet right, it probably works just about as well. Uh, the trouble is I think a lot of people don't know how to do that. Uh, I think they probably use too thin a sheet or don't put it in the right spot. The, the commercial pelvic binders give you a little bit better ABCD on how to put it on, how to cinch it up. It's easier to loosen uh, or tighten up just a little bit more than if you've got a knot or you're trying to wind something around it to, to tighten it up. But and if pinch, you know, uh, in a pinch you can sure use uh, sheet binders. I think the commercial ones probably are a, a little bit better. That's just my gestalt. If I had stock in one of those companies, I'd probably be more aggressively telling you to use them, but I don't. Any other questions about pelvic fractures? And, and, and uh, I've read, uh, too, that uh, the sensitivity and specificity for the physical exam with pelvic fractures is sometimes not as reliable. Uh, yeah, when, when we're talking about, uh, you know, doing these, uh, the pelvic rocks and looking for uh, give and take on these uh, unstable fractures, um, our imaging skills are so much better now than they used to be that I wouldn't spend a lot of time doing that, mainly because it's very uncomfortable for the patient and you can really make uh, an unstable fracture more unstable. And the more you open those things up, the more you can, you have a, maybe you have a clot, a little tamponade effect going on, and once you spring that open, 
you're going to dislodge that uh, that clot. Uh, you could cause uh, theoretically you could cause a you know a pulmonary embolus, uh, but it's more that you've you've you you've had that patient stabilizing maybe a little bit, and when you do all these leg tractions and 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 trying to open the the iliac wings by compressing, you then reopen it, re causing things to rebleed. So you really need to be very cautious about those those uh, manipulations on these th these patients. Okay, well that concludes. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat>